and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is your Reverend, Faith and Current Affairs. Very pleased to be joined today by none other than Justin Riley. Now, Justin, I've not said this to you before, but this is this is quite something for me because I can't actually remember when I started listening to podcasts, but I'm fairly sure that Unbelievable was one of the first podcasts that I ever listened to. And I listened to it pretty religiously for a number of years. Um, and it was a great it was a great thing for me. I learned so much. And I think you did a you did a wonderful service for people like me, you know, Christians and people within the church, but clearly beyond the church as well, with people who are non-Christians um coming to faith, hearing uh, an intellectual or a rational arguments for faith and so on and so forth so it's 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 quite an honor to have you on on this podcast you know many years later as as a as i sort of see you as a trailblazer in the in the christian wow. past world well that's very kind jamie and i mean i think i i received an education in the course of doing unbelievable like many people who listened along to it because when i started that show i was i was very green i you know oh. barely heard about the word apologetics and and it was very sort of early days of podcasting i mean we were really early adopters back in 2007 i think we started mm -hmm. the podcast um nowadays you know you can't move for podcasts so mm -hmm. i think there's a great deal more choice on offer mm -hmm. uh, uh, but it's great to know that the, the the show had that kind of yeah sort of effect in your in your walk yourself yeah absolutely and i think one of the other things about it is the way that you were able to bring together people with different points of view in um yeah, in a really quite genuine way. I mean, there have been some of some episodes of Unbelievable that have got really spicy, you know, and almost sort of mm. out, out of control. Um, but yeah, I mean, you always did a brilliant job of, of moderating. But Your, yours was fairly civil, I seem to remember. It wasn't <laughs> it wasn't too <laughs> it wasn't too spicy. No, it wasn't. I mean, it was it was a little bit. I, I enjoyed, we did one on on the lockdown with um, yeah John Stevens, wasn't it? That's um, right. Um, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to be as respectful as possible of him because. I was aware, you know, he's not an Anglican. He's coming from a different position. But at mm. the same time, I still wanted to sort of push a little bit. Um, so I, I felt that was a really good uh, conversation. Mm. Um, and it was it was great. It was great to be on. But I think that's such an important thing to to bring different points of view into dialogue. And I do believe that, you know, as a sort of principle, um, that's where you get the clarity. I think there's too much sort of, I mean, we'll probably talk about cancel culture and all that kind of stuff later on. There's too much fear around disagreement around hearing points of view that might offend or mm, one might mm. disagree with um so i think that what you were doing there was was really important in apart from anything else in in terms of demonstrating an actual an approach to dialogue as it were yeah well thank you i i mean that was really what the show was about to try and get christians out of their echo chambers i think unfortunately you know since the show launched in 2007 you then had the advent of social media and that really did kind of ramp up the the nature of echo chambers in a in a sort of unexpected way um and so i think the show only became more important over the years in terms of creating a genuine space for for that dialogue and that kind of yeah as you say kind of anti-cancel culture kind of place for people to to have civil disagreement you know mm, yeah absolutely but now you've moved on and mm. you're you're doing you've gone on to pastors and you've left you left unbelievable you were there what was it sort of 15 years or something like that so that's right so what yeah what was the decision and what, what are you doing now well it was just the right time um there was a lot of things i would say that were were god sort of things that that led to the point where i felt actually it's the right time to move on i mm -hmm. i was really proud of everything i'd managed to to do through the show we built a wonderful team of small team of people working on our resources a number of podcasts not just unbelievable video shows and so on um but I, yeah i think i was feeling like actually maybe the time's come for me to branch out a bit more independently um sometimes it's a little bit easier to collaborate with people and do things outside of sort of you know being tied in with one specific organization and so 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 there were just a number of opportunities that i felt god was calling me to to go for and so I thought, well, maybe this is the time. So, yeah, at, at the sort of I think it was probably 17 and a half years in <laughs> since we'd actually begun wow. the show, because, um, uh, yeah, we began as a radio show before we even started podcasting. You know, so this was back in 2005. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, it was I had I, I made a very bittersweet farewell to the show. Mm -hmm. We sort of did a, a kind of look back over the years and the show continues in new hands. So there's um, sort of guest presenters who are currently at the helm uh they're trying a few different show formats at the moment but yeah i'm really enjoying sort of some new projects um 
I've been involved in um, launching a new podcast with the Centre for Cultural Witness based at Lambeth Palace Library in London. We're doing it's called Reenchanting. Uh, mm-hmm. We've got some really interesting characters. Anyone who enjoys Irreverent will probably enjoy mm-hmm. a number of the people we've we've interviewed for Reenchanting uh, for season one. We're just in the process of recording season two for release this autumn um i've been guest hosting on some other podcasts bit of speaking writing but um the big thing is is the launch of the book uh the surprising rebirth of belief in god and i'm also working on a podcast documentary series that will also launch with the book in september so it's uh it's it's busy 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 absolutely absolutely and um just for listeners to say that we'll put links to all this stuff on the show notes uh, beneath the podcast or beneath the video on, on YouTube. So uh, do do check out uh, Reenchanting, Justin's new podcast, and indeed the book, which is what we're going to talk about today. Now, I've only got a, an electric copy of the book, so I can't hold it up. Do you do you have a do you have a, an actual physical I copy? I do. I do. Here it, here it is for anyone yeah. watching on video. There we go. The surprising yes. rebirth of belief in God. Is there a subtitle? I've just there is. There is. Um, in fact, the subtitle kind of is the thesis in miniature. Um, why new atheism grew old and secular thinkers are considering Christianity again. Yes, yes, indeed. And this is a sort of follow up, I suppose, to your first, I think it was your first book, wasn't it about um, what was it called? Why after what was it called? Why after 10 years? It, it, well, the, the the book was called after the show Unbelievable. And the subtitle again was a long one called oh. with the was why after 10 years of talking with atheists, I'm still a Christian. The problem, of course, with writing a subtitle like that is that it immediately goes out of date because it's now 17 and a half years of talking with atheists yeah. that I'm still a Christian. But um, yeah, that that at the point where I was writing the book, it was about the 10 year mark of the show. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So we're going to get into this. I mean, I really recommend this book. I've I've read it cover to cover. I think it's really, really interesting. In my sh- in my show notes, I didn't actually share this in the notes that I, I shared with you just now. I just jotted it down. But I've written, uh, please convince me to be an optimist about the future. <laughs> So that's, that's, that's what I'm I, I I get very much the sense that probably we see a lot of the same things, mm. but maybe we we're running them through a different filter. Yours are slightly more pessimistic, possibly more realistic. Who knows? Mine minus more, slightly more optimistic view. But um, yes, I'm looking forward to, to chatting that through. Absolutely, absolutely, de- definitely. And I'm op- I'm open minded. I, I'd like I'd like I'd like to be an optimist, um, <laughs> ultimate optimist, of course, because we both obviously believe in the return of Christ. Mm. It's just a question mm. of what's going to happen in the intervening time. Mm. Um, so anyway, let's let's talk a bit about the background uh, of of this of this um, phenomenon that you're talking about, the surprising rebirth of belief in God. So a lot of your work on Unbelievable and the engagement with the public conversation at first, I think, was around uh, the new atheism, uh, Richard Dawkins, you know, Christopher Hitchens, all of that kind of stuff, which which sort of seems a bit passe now. Um, mm. One of your, the early chapters in the book, you're talking about um, the death of the the new atheist movement. So can you just say a bit about that? You know, what what, what did that look like and, and what's the state of new atheism now as far as you're concerned? Mm. Well, I'm going to assume that many listeners and viewers are familiar with what the new atheism is, but the show, in a sense, the unbelievable show, was born into the sort of the, the early days of that. Um, the God delusion hadn't quite been published, but when it was, it became the sort of defining thing that you know we often were reacting to the Richard Dawkins style of anti-theism, mm-hmm. and that obviously was riding high in bestsellers. There were atheist conferences. There was a kind of thriving online community around this. They were getting lots of headlines. Um, there was even, you know, the atheist bus campaign. You may remember that, you know, London buses circulating saying there's probably no God now. Stop worrying and enjoy your life. Um, but it did sort of fizzle out um, over the course of about a decade, I'd say. And I noticed this, especially in terms of the shows that I was having, having begun, the sh- you know, the first half of the, if you like, the life of Unbelievable was these quite bombastic debates between these new atheist type characters and Christian thinkers. Um, I gradually noticed more people saying, well, I'm not really a Richard Dawkins kind of atheist. Mm -hmm. And I also noticed the emergence of a lot more people who were willing to give Christianity the time of day, um, you know, who weren't who were not necessarily Christians, but they were aware of the cultural value of Christianity. They believed that actually believing in God wasn't a complete delusion. And and I began to have more and more of these conversations with these people who were still secular but these sort of you know but just more open to christianity really and and these were more nuanced conversations and i just discovered that there were more and more people kind of eventually switching over from that sort of new atheist kind of rhetoric to this more considered sort of style i think this went hand in hand with 
a certain number of you know ructions in the new atheist movement itself um so it was both that it kind of began to feel a little bit passe it it started to sound quasi religious itself because it was often so dogmatic and fundamentalist and you know you could even argue it had its own you know high priest in the four horsemen of the new atheism its sacred texts its orthodoxy was scientific materialism and it had its heretics you know who who were rounded upon if they disagreed with it so there was all of that going on that that I kind of think contributed to to it sort of becoming seen as a bit of a, a quasi religious thing in itself but then even within the movement you know there were massive disagreements and I outlined some of these in the first chapter of the book uh once essentially once they agreed that god didn't exist and religion was bad for you the new atheists couldn't really agree on much else there was no really positive ethic that they were able to build and mm-hmm. some wanted to go in the direction of a kind of very rights based social justice kind of direction sometimes labeled atheism plus and the plus denoted you know including women's rights lgbt race and so on others felt this was just taking the whole movement off course it was you know politically correct ideology and they just wanted you know an oasis of free thinking and reason um and they kind of you know started to react quite strongly against that and so the infighting in the new atheist movement actually quickly overtook the kind of battles they were fighting with christians ironically to the point where you know many of these atheist speakers were no longer willing to share a stage with each other atheist conferences were being cancelled there were all kinds of controversies in the online sphere the blogosphere richard dawkins kept making gaffes on twitter and being cancelled by his own side for various reasons so it was a kind of um yeah a movement that sort of unraveled almost as quickly as it had begun with these sort of best selling books that that sort of launched the movement itself and and i was sort of watching from the sidelines and just just fascinated in a sense that as it became more religious in nature it kind of suffered the same fate that so many religions suffer of sort of undergoing splits and controversies and and eventually that to some extent i think contributed to it becoming a bit of a yeah a, a spent movement in the end mm. yeah i mean it's 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 amazing the the new atheist thing i think i became a christian in 2006 and um, well, I think it was 2006, can't quite remember. I think it was baptised in 2006. Um, and I remember looking at the book, The God Delusion, and, and sort of almost feeling slightly worried about reading it. And I, I did I did read it, but it just became clear to me immediately, even though I wasn't, you know, I'm sort of studying philosophy and stuff like that. I didn't know all that much, though, but it became clear to me quite quickly that this was very vacuous and very shallow. And I think when when you look at, what the new atheism actually did on an intellectual level, it basically opened up all of these conversations around, you know, the existence of God, around ethics, around, well, you know, conversations around the good life, around how to, you know, order society politically maybe. And it was sort of saying in this very childish, um, adolescent way, you know, all we need to do is get rid of religion and then everything will be fine. And Mm -hmm. and that, that as a thesis, I think is so blatantly silly that it's inevitable that it would it would outwork in this way yeah it i think it was very naive and i think in a way the the downfall if you like of the new atheism only served to prove that it really isn't that simple you know just upholding science and reason as though that's going to give people meaning purpose and identity and, and there's a whole slew of articles currently coming out actually interestingly in podcasts talking about the idea that the new atheism actually laid the ground for what is you know currently the culture wars and all the infighting around those issues because it effectively pulled the rug from under a kind of an idea of there being sort of objective meaning and purpose and that kind of thing it kind of laid the ground for this idea of you can basically you know life is up to you to make what you will of it and you can invent your identity and so on from scratch but yeah i'd say that the, the new atheism itself was not a really intellectually robust kind of thing it had some popular speakers it you know it had good rhetoricians like christopher mm-hmm. hitchens yeah. uh, who were great for a soundbite you know it but it essentially traded in slogans more than intellectual ideas and mm-hmm. you know and as i outline in the book it actually ducked very frequently these characters ducked actual you know robust philosophical exchanges with some of the leading christian thinkers of the day so it was um it was, yeah, kind of like the teenage atheist phase almost of, of atheism um, in, in an ironic way. It, it, the, the fact that the old atheists were 
a lot more serious in a sense than the new atheists who who kind of were your teenage atheists almost yeah and yeah just a very shallow engagement you know i remember um richard dawkins engagement with aquinas in in the god delusion it's very it's very um embarrassing almost because he he just clearly doesn't understand thomas aquinas five ways um really really embarrassing for, for a man of his level of intellectual sophistication to be to be doing that well i think the problem was in a sense was that he didn't even feel like it ne- he needed to understand mm. it i mean mm. i think the, the the sense you get in the book and when you hear him talking about these things is is he thinks theology and philosophy is, is just a kind of ridiculous subject anyway you know it, it, it can't hold a candle to science basically so the fact that he you know essentially subscribes to a kind of scientism um, means that he was never going to be bothered to put in the work of actually trying to understand these arguments, you know. So yeah, the you know he he deals in with the ontological argument in about a page in the blood delusion as though you know that's going to sort of yeah. sort that one out. Um, so it's it's kind of it is kind of ridiculous, and many people have pointed out that you know that's what you get when you mm-hmm. ask someone who's a biologist to write a book that's essentially a philosophy and theology book. But but it was still an international bestseller, and that can be frustrating for, for yeah. actual theologians and philosophers. But that, yeah. that's that's life. Absolutely, yeah. And now that I think about it, actually, it was Dawkins that, that really um, introduced me to David Bentley Hart, who I read his um, book, um, Atheist Delusions, and mm. I was just blown away by by the critique of of um, of new atheism, and then his subsequent book, The Experience of God, and and Hart really for me, I mean, he's I think he's gone a bit you know a bit funny in recent years, but he's been he's been massively influential for me mm. to this particular conversation. So um, so so helpful on on making those kind of um, you know those those classical or at least the arguments or at least the articulations for the you know, the classical view of God so clear mm. and in contrast to just the, the silly kind of anthropomorphic understanding that somebody like Richard Dawkins has. I mean, the experience of God basically demonstrated for me, to me, that Richard Dawkins and co just don't understand what the Christian God actually is. They don't, on a basic kind of conceptual mm. level, mm. they don't understand, um, the, they don't understand concepts like necessity, for example, and, and contingency. Mm. They don't understand what we what we what we say when we're talking about the the being of God and the being yeah. uh, or the being of beings being contingent upon his being and all this kind of stuff. Um, it is a tricky one, isn't it? Because it's hard to know how to actually communicate this kind of thing. It, it is. I, I think one of the problems you run into is is when someone is already wedded to a kind of very purely sort of scientific way of understanding the world is that that's the only way of understanding or explaining anything Mm. then inevitably they just put god into this filter of science and they say well yes i I would believe in god if there was scientific evidence for god but of course you will never get in that sense a scientific proof for god because then god would just be another part of the natural world that it would just be another natural thing and science would actually be the god you know naturalism would be the god uh of such a such a system um and so it's a kind of um trying to sort of and the problem sometimes comes when christians try to sort of meet atheism on its own terms in that way and try and essentially just prove god in this kind of purely almost naturalistic scientific way mm-hmm. and it's not that i don't think there are things from science that point to god and i talk about those in the book but ultimately god is the author of science there, there's a sort of sense in which you you're not gonna sort of just be able to put god under the microscope in the way you can any other normal thing yeah. so so it's a kind of it is a um it, 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 it is hard to know what to do with someone who just you know is in that mindset but needs to kind of come up a level basically and see that the, the very thing they're doing this science is itself very hard to mm. uh, justify without something that actually undergirds it and and for men oftentimes when i talk to naturalists you know of the dawkins type of variety they they just say well that's my brute fact you know that mm. that science and the, the universe exists you know and i'm just not prepared to go any further than that kind of thing so there's a kind of cutoff point almost that that a lot of those people have yeah yeah exactly and this sort of this sort of um leads to to a, a question about this that i have which is really how do you think it's still worthwhile trying to engage on this sort of level because it seems to me that 
although the new atheist thing clearly has receded, there still seems to me this sort of baked baked in assumption um, with people that you know that many of the athe- new atheist tropes kind of traded on. You know that the the medieval period was a period of darkness and um, superstition and inquisitions and all that kind of stuff, crusades and so on. And really, what happened in the early modern period is that science and the advent of um, the advent of political liberalism and the nation state and so on liberated us from the darkness of the religious past. Um, and as I say, I think this is a kind of, and it's hard, it's hard to say these things, isn't it? But, you know, with, with any kind of accuracy, but it seems to me that it, this is something that people are still very conditioned in. I saw in, oh, yeah. um, a, uh, a comment on a video um, that I was involved in on YouTube the other day, just saying exactly this. I was, I was making a point, you know, very similar to the kind of points you make in the book, uh, perhaps in a slightly more negative way, which is that you know, as Chris, as Christian faith recedes, the the values that we that we um, hold on to, which are essentially dependent upon Christianity, will change and and recede as well. And this person would just said, well, you know, we had a period of you know darkness and superstition and ignorance, blah blah blah, and we've been liberated from that. And so you know, I think we'll ju- be just fine without Christianity. Thank you very much. So I don't know how how do you think yeah. engage, it was it, quite engaging with this stuff. I, I I think it's always worth engaging, but there's a kind of point at which you just feel like you are pushing against a sea of ignorance sometimes. I know what it feels like, especially in the comments on YouTube videos. But yeah. at the end of the day, the, the, as a kind of cultural movement, I would say new atheism is, is passe. But of course, it, there's still lots of corners of the internet where that rhetoric continues to thrive and it just pe- it's what people know. It's easy, you know, in a way. It's a, it's a simple narrative religion bad science good you know the church was a break on progress and now we're you know living in the enlightenment of you know rationalism and everything else it's a kind of it's an easy story to kind of for people to pick up and understand it is a completely ridiculous false story and there's lots of good historians out there who can set people right and there's lots of people doing it now you know if you go to even something like um uh, history for atheists mm. uh, run by tim o'neill where he's sort of uh, as an atheist, it is like setting a lot of his fellow atheists straight on the facts of history, simply, you know, and and pointing out that this story about, you know, the Enlightenment suddenly bringing light and reason and everything, you know, to the dark and mid- medieval ages where the church was such a terrible break on progress is is a complete myth. Mm-hmm. And, um, and uh, you know, pointing out the way in which Christians were at the center of the scientific revolution and everything else. Stuff that is not hard to discover if you just go and do a little bit of history. But unfortunately, we have these sort of popular versions of history that are still parroted and and put about on the Internet and, you know, certainly appeared in all of those best selling books from the New Atheists. How do you counter that? I mean, my hope is that we are actually seeing a bit of a pushback from that. So. I'm I'm encouraged when I see Tom Holland's Dominion, you know, becoming a bestseller, him fronting the most popular history podcast in the world. It's like, okay, so there's someone who is kind of pushing against these narratives, who's quite well known, quite popular. And um, and it, it gives, I think, a lot of Christians a bit more confidence to say, oh, actually, you know, the narrative can be changed. I don't think that that this, you know, this has to this mythology has to be the thing that that just persists. Of course, it's going to, you know, it, it takes a long time for, for you know, these things that have been sewn in and th- this kind of, you know, and the new atheism did a great job of mm. sewing this this narrative about science and faith and everything else. Um, so it's going to take a long time to undo. But I don't think it it's impossible to do that, because I think when I look at the the kind of blogs and books and people that are being taken seriously now, they're not. They don't tend to be the new atheist variety. It the conversation at that upper level has shifted, and and my hope is you will see that sort of trickle down effect, uh, as I think I am seeing, you know, um, among a kind of wider population. Mm, yeah, I think the problem is that it takes some intellectual effort and um, curiosity to actually get to the point. Mm. Of the age, doesn't it? I mean, I was thinking about you actually had them on your show, um, Hutchins and and Garano's book, um, of mm. and Unicorns, which again is an excellent book. But it's the kind of book that there has to be some intellectual curiosity and some time set aside to actually engage with it. And it's just so easy, isn't it, to just go along with this mm. very, very simple, simplistic narrative. 
which on some level, you know, we're just we're just conditioned in. I, I think about Charles Taylor's phrase, the um, the social imaginary, and I think it's basically part of our social imaginary that you almost have to you almost have to wrestle yourself away from it and look at the, mm. the nuance and try and understand. Um, you know all the all the problems with that view, but but that leads that leads very nicely to this um, what you call the new conversation on God, which is uh, as far as I can understand, I think you you sort of locate it historically at least in its first iteration with the so called intellectual dark web, and then see manifestations of it in, as you say, people like um, Tom Holland, maybe Douglas Murray as well, um, and here we have secular thinkers who are challenging, you know, the prevailing um, orthodoxy, maybe around science and religion, maybe around, you know, liberal... Just one moment, Jamie. My headphones have just failed, so... Yeah. Uh, they, they, they were low on battery. Hang on, I just need to swap to... Uh, it's okay, no problem. A new set of headphones. Apologies. You might have to... Yeah, it depends. It depends how... Prof- Cue that question up again. It depends how professional I'm feeling, but I may edit it out. I may just leave it in for... Viewers' interest to see you change your headphones. I can't hear anything you're saying. It. That's okay. Let me just uh, swap over. Uh, right, I can hear you again now. Great. Um, yeah, no, I was just saying that. Obviously, it starts with the intellectual dark web. Then you get people like Tom Holland, and these secular things are kind of challenging the pre- prevailing liberal orthodoxy around science and religion, maybe around sort of political liberalism as well, in interesting ways. So, I mean, can you tell us how you see that new conversation on God? You know, where did that start? Um, what's the state of it now? And why, why do you find it encouraging? Because I think one of the one of the slight pushbacks that people might have on that is, well, it's it's good that people are sort of recognising this. You know, your, your Petersons, your Hollands, your Murrays, mm-hmm. etc. These people still aren't Christians and mm-hmm. they're not really, well... I guess there's a question there as to how, to what extent they're actually promoting Christianity, uh, and to what extent it's it's helpful what they're doing. So I don't know. Do you have? I'm sure you do have thoughts about that. I do. I have lots of thoughts about that. Um, hmm. I think I think there was this basically swing back of the pendulum against the new atheist kind of rhetoric and dismissiveness of God and religion, hmm. and. It, I think it happened sort of almost quite quickly while new atheism was still riding high, but it's it's kind of it's increasingly happened where more and more of these secular intellectuals are kind of recognizing that they just threw the baby out with the bathwater, that that they kind of by labeling everything religious bad, it was simply a huge overstatement, simplification, very naive. And um, and so you got like characters like Jonathan Haidt, who, you know, secular psychologist sort of publishing books essentially you know on the the way that religion can be good for us and the kind of ancient wisdom of scripture and the things that sort of you know give people um you you obviously have jordan peterson who kind of rolled into town and was this sort of dramatic character who suddenly seemed to be drawing a very similar audience to the ones that have been turning up for the new atheist for several Mm -hmm. years and he was filling lecture halls you know on with three-hour lectures on the book of genesis and lots of these young men turning up looking for meaning and purpose and identity and suddenly being told well hey there's this uh, book called the bible and it just seems to perfectly encapsulate everything that is meaningful for life today um so and 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 you know and very explicitly being set against the new atheist sort of idea that that we need to jettison all of this Mm. um yeah and and that intellectual dark web movement kind of it was it was a mixture of things going on there was a, a certain amount of it was just kind of an early form of the kind of anti woke sort of um politically incorrect kind of folk getting together and sort of saying things that they wanted to say without being cancelled but at the same time there was a flavor in it which was which was kind of like also well let's 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 be a bit heretical about everything what if religion isn't that bad for us what if actually there's there's some good stuff here and it was just interesting to hear that kind of being voiced. And so you would have these sort of, you know, within the IDW, you know, Sam Harris arguably was one of those members, but mm-hmm. he was on, you know, in these big arena debates with Jordan Peterson, essentially debating God, you know, for four nights with tens of thousands of people watching. And I found that quite exciting and invigorating. And I thought, you know, well, Jordan Peterson isn't a Christian, but he certainly kind of seems to be coming out in favor of the value of Christianity and not sort of you know just dismissing it and uh and likewise i then discovered you know that i mean the idw kind of was a 
phrase that got used for a while for that movement. I'm not sure it exists per se in that in wh- that way anymore. It's more just you tend to see it, it's kind of morphed into the kind of more kind of anti woke, mm. you know, arguably conservative side of Twitter and social media and mm. the blogosphere and podcasts and so on versus the kind of progressive left sort of side. And um, and in a sense there's a kind of religious element to that there's there's this kind of interesting point where a lot of those thinkers are saying well the problem is that, that we've kind of created this issue in the west where we live in this morass of varying opinions different identities and everything else and i think they're kind of recognizing that there was this value to the christian faith because it kind of gave people a sort of solid identity and story to live into and they're wondering well given that we live in a post-Christian age, what are we possibly going to do to replace that? Because it feels like we had, haven't got any equivalent story that can actually give people that sense of purpose and meaning. And so you do have interesting people like, you know, Tom Holland, as I mentioned, um, talking about the way in which the, the West and our values and moral instincts have all been shaped by the Christian revolution, um, even though he's, you know, on the face of it, a Christian necessarily. Um, and you've got people like Douglas Murray, who describes himself as a Christian atheist, mm. but essentially has been saying more and more as I listen to him, sort of, what are we going to do, guys, in the absence of the Christian story? I just can't see a good alternative at this point because it's just turning into, you know, this constant culture warring and everything. Um, and then uh, just a whole host of other people that I've been coming across who are sort of edging in that direction, who are kind of picking that up. And then just discovering kind of on the ground a whole lot of people for whom these thinkers have been a kind of gateway drug to either taking Christianity more seriously Mm -hmm. or walking through the door to Christian faith. You know, people who have actually sort of gone all the way, even further than some of these people themselves have. Um, You ask, why aren't they Christians? I mean, I would say that actually a lot of them are on various different points in that journey. I think some of them are to all intents and purposes christians they just maybe haven't been very they haven't worn that on their sleeve or or kind of they they hold it in a maybe a different way to an evangelical or very sort of you know overt christian others i think are holding it at arm's length Mm. but they kind of they they struggle to deny the, the 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 cultural importance of christianity even if they they don't feel quite able to subscribe to it as a sort of metaphysical level so i i guess i'm just pointing out that there's an interesting kind of um movement going on it's Mm -hmm. it's it's not a it's hard to kind of label it you know intellectual dark web was a useful label but these things move around people kind of you know new people enter people go off and do other things so i'm not quite sure what to call it but i i kind of decided this label the surprising rebirth of belief in god would do as a way of sort of capturing the fact that the conversation has changed and it feels like it's a lot more intellectually respectable than mm. it was yeah. to talk about god and to talk about christianity in these circles i'm not saying that that translates into the comments in youtube at this point but it's it, it for me it felt like there was a, a just a change of tone and um in 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 that that kind of level of of the intellectual kind of discussion on it mm, yeah it's a sort of post secular interest in christianity mm. and i think the the point of agreement a strong agreement uh, for me with your book is when you talk about the insufficiency of recognizing the cultural value of christianity as much as that's a good thing to recognize that um, it's not actually sufficient in order to answer the problems that people have. You know, you talk about the meaning crisis, for example, it's not really it's not really sufficient to, to answer that at a deep level, at a sort of um, I the right phrase, at a kind of full level, mm. at a deep level. And I think that's that's the point which I which I have strong agreement with you. If you, if you look at somebody like Tom Holland, he talks about I've heard him talk. I've read his I've read Dominion twice and I've read some of his other books um, and I've listened to him talk about the way that he recognizes that his what he describes as his liberal beliefs are derived from Christianity. He recognizes that as a kind of contingent historical fact. But it seems to me that and again, I don't know the man, never met him. I don't know him personally, but it seems to me that there's then a reluctance for him and then i think this would apply maybe to some of those other people as well there's a reluctance to sort of then think well 
okay, well, if my beliefs are contingent upon this, then surely I need to reckon with the ontology and the metaphysics, if you like, you know, what, what's the actual truth of the matter? And if my, if my values are just what I prefer, then um, doesn't that say something about the objective reality or, you know, the basis of these values? So I've got to really answer this question on, on mm. some I, I, I think that level. Tom Holland, you know, just in terms of his public statements on this and interviews and so on and you know what you can read in the the chapter where i kind of focus on him quite a bit in the book i think he he recognizes everything you've just said mm. and he acknowledges it all and he specifically says you know my belief in human rights equality and dignity is a theological belief it's yeah. not you know it's it's he says i'm so I, he kind of recognizes that he has a faith <laughs> that it's you know very clearly has a faith of some kind and he also quite clearly sees the kind of secular material story of reality as really uninteresting pallid anemic he doesn't want it to be true yeah he finds the christian story far more interesting far more engaging compelling mm. now you'd have to ask tom holland exactly where he is at a personal level i think you know again i think it's as a matter of record that he he actually is a communicant member of the anglican church now and to that extent, he, I think, has said, well, look, I've got my doubts. Mm. We all have. <laughs> mm. But I'm, I, I, you know, I want this to be true. And there's always going to be a leap of faith at the mm. end of the day. Yes. So I think, I think what I, but what I really, you know, regardless of where Tom Holland happens to be at a personal level on this, what I, I really value about what he's doing is he's just pointing out to people that they have a faith. Mm. Um, now, that's interesting because he's a historian who's simply saying, look, this is where your beliefs and values came from, okay? Um, and just pointing out that it, it is not, as you probably assumed, and I had once assumed, just a kind of result of a sort of secular enlightenment, rational sort mm. of approach to life. This is very unusual. We're living in a very unusual moment in history where we believe in these things called human rights and so on in the West. Mm -hmm. And they go, they could go away again. Mm -hmm. Um, and and to that extent, I think that's just really helpful because it does put a stone in people's shoe to say, oh, yeah, well, what is the basis for why I, I do hold to this stuff so strongly? And for me, um, that is often the start of a journey. It certainly has been, I think, for Tom. Yeah. And I think for others, it can be as well to to kind of asking, well, what's 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 really underneath all this, you know? Yeah, I've I've seen that as well. I've seen that as a well established path for many people, you know, new, new atheism or something similar. Uh, then some kind of engagement with these sort of transitional thinkers, and then movement into actual Christian um, belief and practice. So I mean, that's that's not a fantasy. That happens with with lots of people, I think. And I think um, one of the things that's interesting about these people is that they're almost they're almost themselves. You can almost see them in a transitional phase, you know, wrestling with these issues. And the fact that they're writing books articulating that sense of transience is really interesting. Another couple of people I'd I'd mention here, a different you know, a different angle would be people like Nina Power and um, Louise Perry. Who again? They're sort of wrestling with the the legacy of Christianity from from a feminist perspective, and I don't. Did you? I don't know whether you've had Louise Perry on. I mean, you have everyone, uh, but yes, I've done a couple of interviews. Oh, yeah. Yeah. One 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 on with one of our big conversations for Unbelievable shortly before I moved on mm -hmm. from the show was with Louise Perry opposite Rod Dreher, um, mm -hmm. talking Great. about Christianity and the sexual revolution. Yeah. And then I've subsequently followed up with an interview with Louise for the mm. Reenchanting podcast, mm. and on both occasions, absolutely. I think, <laughs> I mean, it, it sounds bad, but I, I almost see Louise as the the female Tom Holland, yeah. but yeah. kind of coming from a kind of she's come at it through looking at sexuality, relationships, and that kind of thing. Yeah. And again, her book, you know, the case against the sexual revolution, coming to these incredibly Christian adjacent. Mm. friendly conclusions about the way that marriage monogamous marriage in the christian tradition has mm. just as it happens been the best way for ensuring um that male and female sexuality is kept within the right guardrails for everyone to flourish and so on mm. um i think it's only really since the publication of that book she's become even more kind of aware of the christian implications and just the kind of idea that maybe you do need something like Christianity 
uh, to be able to make this work, you know, um, and and to that extent, I think, again, someone who's on a very interesting journey who um, I'll be fascinated to see where that goes. Um, I mean, I note that Jordan Peterson is apparently his next book is called We Who Wrestle With God. Right. And there is this kind of wrestling with God going on, I think, uh, among some of these characters. Um, so they're kind of almost working out their faith in public, you know, as they as they come across these issues and and wonder where where it might eventually lead. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I I'm interested in that. Uh, it doesn't mean that there's a revival around the corner or anything like that. But I just for me the 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 metaphor I use in the book is that it feels like the tide is maybe about to turn. Yeah. Um, so I, I start the whole book with this sort of, you know, well-worn line from Matthew Arnold's poem, Dover Beach, about the melancholy, long withdrawing roar of mm. the sea of faith. And that's often been used as a metaphor for the way that, you know, religion has gone out in the last 150 years and science and secularism has swept in in its place. But as Douglas Murray pointed out in a, in a conversation I had with him, he said, the sea of faith could come back in again. That's mm -hmm. the point of tides. And I, I it just made me think, yeah, actually, maybe what we're seeing with this sort of this change in the conversation, interesting people converting to Christianity. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, one swallow doesn't make a summer and all that. But at the same time, I wondered, could this just be the start of something where that this kind of the sea of faith going out to its furthest ebb? And we might just be starting to see the the, the turning of that tide eventually. Mm. Yeah, and I think the, the case against the sexual revolution is a really good um, point, uh, case in point, because, um, I mean, I found that book deeply shocking. You know, I mean, I, I, I didn't think of myself as a naive person, but I read that book and I was just, um, I was I was almost disgusted by by the things that, that Louise Perry details in it. Um, yeah, not 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 because it's a bad book, but because it's a very good book. Yeah, and it makes, it's a very honest book. Yeah, exactly. It makes things very very explicit about about where people are at in terms of the brokenness and you know, frankly, the sinfulness of of their of what they do with with their sexuality and with with the gift of sex and all of that kind of stuff. And it's it was really interesting to me because it was like looking it full on in the face and thinking to myself, well, you know, thank thank God I'm not part of this world and you know that that i know christ and 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 that i have i have god's wisdom on this matter um and then it was really interesting getting to the end of the book where louise offers this um sage advice and it, it is sage advice that she gives but at the same time one is left feeling there's a kind of radical insufficiency here you know there's there's more to this than just saying well it, it's interesting you say that because i talked to her about the advice she gives towards the end of the book, which is essentially, you know, basically don't get into bed on the first date, kind of, you know, wait a bit, um, uh, try and sort of, you know, be more discerning about your sexual partners and, yeah. and this sort of thing. Um, and she said to me, she was tempted to just go the full hog and say, wait until you're married before really? you have sex. Interesting. Yeah. Um, but she said she just didn't feel like she could, that would just be so absurd in yeah. our culture that kind of advice that she she didn't feel like she could write that in the book yeah. but that's i think what she wanted to write she wanted to say that's that's the safest option actually yeah. Yeah. and um and i wonder i i also think if you know someone like louise perry who was born and bred in the kind of you know uber liberal secular world you know sexual world that that all young young people today grow up in sort of had that kind of a conversion <laughs> in that respect uh it does feel like there's a tide that's turned there in her life but she reflected to me that she gets she's now so many young women after reading that book said i'm so glad someone has said this it's given me permission to mm -hmm. basically not play by the rules of the current sexual culture and i think sometimes you just need someone who maybe isn't you or me a kind of yeah. christian yeah. to kind of point it out i, I think that's one of the the gifts actually is that these are sort of almost prophets from outside the church mm -hmm. who who people are almost more willing to listen yeah. um because they're not your usual suspects mm -hmm. they're not just you know the mary white house railing against sexual you know yeah. you know stuff um so i'm i'm quite encouraged in that sense and again it, you know there there it's not like 
Louise Perry stands against the vast weight of other people who are, you know, are fully engaged in the sexual revolution. But it still feels like that's a significant voice. That's a significantly different way of doing things. And and maybe the pendulum is starting to swing swing back again in that way. Yeah, no, I see that. And in terms of the, um, you know, the Dover Beach type thing, the the tide in terms of sexuality does seem to have gone out very very far. Um, especially when you read a book like that, and you actually you actually confront the reality of it in terms of the ubiquity of you know, pornography addiction, for example, or, or whatever it might be, um, many of the other things she talks about. Um, and one can see that lots and lots of people are very, very broken, damaged, utterly miserable because of it. And so then there's an, there's an opportunity there uh, for somebody like Louise to come along and say, well, you know, there is an alternative way of thinking about this. And then that sort of opens up all sorts of interesting conversations. You know, I can absolutely see that. And I, and I am, I am feeling more optimistic um, so far, Justin. So, so that's, so that's good. Well, but, but just to, to, to bring down your levels of optimism a bit in that case, Jamie, um, I think Louise herself recognises, you know, with that book and in the conversations I've had with her, that it's going to be really difficult for people to swim against that tide in the sense, you know, to use that metaphor again, Um people who maybe feel like yeah i do need you know i'm not going to just get into a sexual relationship or maybe even feel called you know they need to sort of wait until they're married or whatever she says because that is just so absurd and bizarre in our culture at the moment and and you can't and i think she recognizes that without something like a christian community helping you to do that it's very, very hard to do it by yourself and this is where i think there is this thing of like that these these interesting intellectuals who are saying this stuff is so useful you know all this ancient wisdom turns out you know might might have had some value to it and and so on mm. and the problem is if you're not also telling people it's true mm. it's going to be really difficult to put any of that into practice because our culture kind of militates against it the only way you can really do it is by living as part of a countercultural movement yeah and i think the only way that's ever <laughs> happened is through the living presence of christ Mm. at the center of that so i do think there is still this question of how much how helpful is it ultimately going to be pointing out this stuff if we don't also embody it believe it's true and kind of live by faith in that way and i think some of these thinkers are are, are kind of aware of that that mm. they're aware that this this might be great advice but completely impractical in today's culture in the absence of becoming a christian essentially mm -hmm. um so yeah that's that's that that's that's the key thing for me and and again where i the problem i have with some of these thinkers as much as i appreciate their work is that frequently they are still talking about christianity as essentially a kind of a useful fiction it's it's really great for culture that that we've developed this idea of human rights and you know um the human dignity you know and yes that absolutely came from genesis chapter 1 and so on but if you don't believe that that is actually the case, that it's just a useful fiction, um, it, it's it's much harder to defend that and to kind of um, live that mm -hmm. in a culture. So, and the reason I believe it's so it's so there's this kind of thing of it's it's kind of metaphorically true because it works. That's kind of the way one of these people, Brett Weinstein, often talks about it. You know, religion is metaphorically true because it's been so successful. It's been a kind of really good evolutionary adapt adaptation mm. but my i would flip that i would say the reason it works is because it's true literally true uh in the case of christianity and i think that that sometimes that's the direction that people need to get to seeing that that, that it's not just a, a really happy coincidence that this stuff happens to produce the kinds of cultures that people seem to want it's it's because it actually is true and and that's kind of the simple point I'm almost trying to drive home is that that these thinkers have kind of got halfway there, but they, they haven't sort of put all the pieces together in that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm on exactly the same page. And and um the the other thing you say there, um really about um about you know the living presence of Christ being at the center of, of any kind of rebirth that might happen really relates to the church, doesn't it? So I mean, this is something that we talk about a lot on a reverend um if you take that what we were just talking about in terms of the sexual revolution um you've got somebody like louise perry coming along and saying that this is this is all wrong it's going in the wrong direction we need to rethink this we need to have a radical rethink perhaps we even need to adopt 
readopt Christian values and so on and so forth. It's a bit of a shame then when the church, at least, well, the Church of England, I would say, is is um, is so fuzzy and unclear about this this kind of thing. I mean, particularly um, in recent days, and not just in the matter of sexuality, but in the matter of everything. It seems to me that the church just needs to be far more confident and distinctively Christian, so that when people actually have these questions and when they're on these these quests for truth and and meaning, that we've actually got something to say to them, and we've got we've got mm. something to offer to them, which is different to the culture. What do you think about I, that? I, I, I think I agree. Um, and it's actually reflected back to me again by these sort of prophets from outside the church who mm. say, well, look, if you wanted me, if I was going to become a Christian, if I was going to go to church, it would have to look different to the culture. If it's just a kind of warmed over version of secular humanism with some God language sprinkled on top, that's not going to, I can get that outside of the church quite easily. If And it's that thing of if the church just reflects basically whatever the contemporary standard of culture is on sexuality and ethics and so on, it, it doesn't look attractive to people who are actually looking for a different story. So there's this sort of repeated theme among many of the people I've spoken to of the sort of keep Christianity weird mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, of course, it creates a higher bar for people. It makes the church unpopular on social media and it does all of those things. But my feeling is if you do kind of go down the route of just accommodating the culture in that way, you, you're you're moving the deck chairs on the titanic it's you're you're on a sinking ship basically and the yeah my, i've increasingly felt over the years that the church just does need to be a bit more have a bit more courage and and sort of um just just go for it i, I know that means they'll the Anglican church will probably split apart mm. but i'm i'm wondering what what's the cost of keeping it together at this point, you know, in that kind of way and, and that sort of thing. So I'm, um, I'm all for unity. I do think, but there's, there's a sort of sense in which it can become a hollow kind of unity when, when ultimately uh, so much is on, on the line in, in that kind of way. Yeah. And you can, you can value unity over faithfulness, mm. which I think is something that is, if it's not said explicitly, it's often implied by certain public statements um, by churchmen nowadays. Um, but I mean, I mean what, what I will say just to, to, to append that is, is I'm also I mean, what I don't want is for the church to just become another clanging symbol in the culture wars. And I, I think there's the, the, the inverse problem is you, you do have certain brands of Christianity in church where it just feels like it's graceless and it's as graceless as the rest of the culture wars when they weigh in on these topics. And um, so I think the church somehow needs to transcend that. It, it needs to be faithful. It needs to look, it needs to keep Christianity weird. It needs to um, do those things that will, will make it a different kind of story and experience to what people are used to in the world. But at the same time, it needs to have tremendous grace for people who do find themselves, you know, same sex attracted and who are, you know, struggling with identity and not just sort of beat them over the head with a sort of anti-woke slogans or anything like that. Um, I just think the church needs to be able to rise above mm. the, the culture wars in that sense. So, so that would be my only sort of caveat, yeah. you know, uh, on that one. Yeah. There needs to be balance there. There needs to be pastoral sensitivity and care. Yeah, absolutely. But Justin, just for the last few minutes, let's talk about this big picture issue. Um, and I'm thinking of uh, how how to articulate this. I was having a I was having a conversation with um, Patrick Deneen. I don't know if you've come across him. He, he, he's a post liberal a Roman Catholic post liberal um, professor of political philosophy at Notre Dame or however they pronounce it in the US. I said Notre Dame, and he he Notre Dame. Yeah, he corrected me. Um, <laughs> very nice of <laughs> um, Anyway, I mean, his thing is. You know um, that there, it is possible that we could we could see a kind of um, a resurrected um, Christian post liberal order in the political sphere. You know, one of the things he said to me, which I found really interesting, is um, he was talking about Oxford. You know, you you and I have both been to Oxford, and uh, we know that you, as as well as anyone that that the the city was set up for a distinctive purpose right to essentially i mean the university anyway was, was set up to train priests you know so mm. there's this kind of um this, this architecture which is reflective of the transcendent you've got all these colleges which are named specifically christian names you know corpus christi christchurch Mount Magdalen college and so on and so forth um and so so there's a there's a whole sort of order which is which is 
embodied in the in the architecture and the nature of the institution and so on and now that's thoroughly that's thoroughly changed you know people mm. formed in different ways now in in secular universities including oxford for different reasons for different ends mm. um new buildings are built which are which are horrendously ugly and, and jar um awfully with the with the medieval architecture of the city and seem to seem to reflect a completely different kind of secular imminent vision of of reality but Deneen says Oxford did happen at some point, you know, and it mm. could happen again in some kind mm. of, you know, post secular form. We could, there could be a new Christendom, there could be a new flowering of of religious faith. It happened once. There's no reason why it can't happen again. Um, but the the thing that he said in terms of pessimism is that it's it's quite easy to see the the current. I mean, he's a post liberal philosopher, so so he would have a very strong critique of of the liberal order from the right and the left. But it, it's it's very very easy to see the liberal order just limping on in mm. the way it's going on for a very long time. And one of the reasons that he um, that he says that it's it's easy to see this going on is because of the increasing zombification of of the human race. You know, the iPhone was invented in two thousand and seven, and now if you look at you know the generation below us. Uh, you know, 30 and under, you know, especially like teenagers, it's like it's almost like they're plugged into the matrix. You know, they can't they can't, you know, uh, they can't think about anything transcendent or anything uh, politically important because they're just they're just looking at, you know, whatever mm. it is they look at nowadays, TikTok or whatever the, the latest social media is. And it's it's like this is this is killing any sense of social responsibility or spirituality or or need for transcendence. So this is a completely sort of ubiquitous phenomenon if you look if you look around you know my my window here in my office looks out to the street almost everyone who, walk, who walks past is looking at an iphone so there's there's this sense of the kind of um quiescence and distraction of people that that keeps them that keeps them from really engaging with any deep conversations so he that's the kind of pessimistic a- aspect of it and then you know the and the things that i point to which 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 i think are worrying are are things like you know i said in the notes i spent, sent over to you you know the the aggressive incursion of the transgender ideology into the public sphere in only the last five six seven years you've got increasingly um acceptable levels of uh, euthanasia you know in in if you look at what's going on in canada in certain places in in europe you know euthanizing children euthanizing depressed people you know all this kind of stuff you've got industrial level abortion really across the whole world um you've got a, a political order which is really dominated by um by secular liberalism you know no real sort of explicit christian representation in the uk it's a little bit more mixed obviously in america you do have populist pushbacks in the form of you know trump or brexit what's going on in italy but it just doesn't really rem- amount to anything sort of christian really it's more a kind of i see that as a more kind of um just a, a rejection and an expression of of anger with the, with the current with the current order, and so I so on the kind of big picture level. I mean, I I hear what you're saying about these um, these these thinkers, and I'm I, I agree with you. It's really encouraging, and it's so it's so helpful that they're saying what they're saying. Mm. But on a big, big big picture level, it looks like the world is moving yeah. in a different direction in a very very confused and dark direction. So I, that, I agree with everything you've said. Know. Basically, I, um, I and I think that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's like when you look at it that way, it's like there's there's it feels like an unstoppable tide, and technology, as you say, is such a significant part of that. And I think it's the reason, essentially, why things like transgender have accelerated in kind of ways that would have been unthinkable, you know, a generation ago for for sort of the rapid pace of change in public perception of that and ideology and so on mm. um is because you know technology allows these things to kind of proliferate in, in a way that they couldn't do before um all i i guess all i can say to to bring my optimist sort of point of view to meet your pessimism there jamie mm. is yeah. that is is the thing that we both agree on i think which is that god is in control and uh we have seen, as your friend rightly noted, the death and rebirth of Christianity at various points in the past. Um, I was also distracted by my iPhone, speaking of iPhones, just because I was looking up the the motto, because I couldn't remember off the top of my head for Oxford University. It was founded, though, with 
the words of Psalm 27, Dominus Illuminatio Mea, the Lord is my light. That's still there, you know, under all the the sort of the banners and the crests, you know, associated with Oxford University. Now, who knows? Maybe someone will get around to cancelling that as well. But the the point is, uh, I agree with your friend. Oxford happened. Oxford University happened. That you know, the the transformation of a culture happened mm. from a pagan to a Christian culture. Um, but it happened over centuries. Mm. You know, this was not a kind of one time deal. And mm. We have seen just in the last 100 years, 150 years, a kind of rapid secularization of culture sweeping across the West. But again, the big picture is that's 150 years in a 2000 year period. Mm -hmm. Who knows what the next thing will be? My my kind of optimistic thing is that we might just be starting to see something emerging now. Mm -hmm. um, and what that will look like, who knows? But I, I just... The, the optimistic side of me is just that faith side that actually God is not done with the church. God is not done with humans. God is not. Um, we we are living through a specific moment in the church, in the West, in history, when we have decided that God doesn't exist for a while and that we can all invent ourselves from scratch. And we've created these devices that really help us to kind of distract ourselves and mm -hmm. anesthetize ourselves and sort of everything else um we are you know as calvin said perpetual idol making factories and, and that's as true today as it was but the early church was surrounded by a completely non-christian culture a completely pagan culture which in various respects did resemble aspects of ours today we've just dressed ours up with a lot more technology and uh, and so on um and yet you know 12 people changed the world essentially um and I think that can happen again. Chesterton talked about the history of Christianity is a constant death and rebirth. Um, and it, it, it survived because it has a God who knew his way out of the tomb, I think is the, is the phrase. And I just think that, that that's what we're seeing as sort of this moment in history. It's probably going to get worse. You know, it's probably not going to look pretty for quite a bit. I just don't think God's done. And I just feel like, there's only so long that people can survive uh, on these sort of partial stories, um, these things that ultimately aren't good for us uh, in, in our culture before enough people kind of wake up, you know, from the matrix, as it were, uh, and say, you know what, there's got to be a different way of doing this. And, oh, here's someone telling me that this old fashioned thing called Christianity once gave people this sense of purpose and dignity and, uh, and everything else. And, and I just, yeah, I, my, my optimistic thesis is that people can't live with the idols and the stories that they tell themselves for very long, because soon enough, it just, it just becomes unlivable. It becomes unbearable. Mm -hmm. And we will see the Christian story as it has in the past. will will come back again, I think. Mm. Well, I very much hope and I think we should pray that you're you're correct and uh, that we are seeing the beginning of a of a, of a, a widespread rebirth in in God um, and faith in Christ. So let's let's take that optimistic word and and go with it. I think as the as the last one uh, for this conversation. But Justin, thank you so much. I'm sure I'm sure the audience uh, for this podcast would have really appreciated that conversation. And um, just to repeat, uh, your book is available now. Is it? Is it just in hardback at the moment? It's not even in hardback. It's only it's only published in softback. Oh, uh, okay. I haven't reached the heights of of having a hardback book oh. yet. I'm afraid, Jamie. But I um, the other the, way around. Well, <laughs> I thought you normally get hardback first, and then well, for whatever reason, the publisher decided to go straight to to softback, which is fine by me. Um, but yeah, it's got a distinctive cover. It's got this sort of tide coming in on mm. the front cover, which sort of is like this sort of central metaphor in the book. And the surprising rebirth of belief in God is the name. Um, you can pre-order now and even get a signed copy straight away via my website. Um, that's justinbriarly.com. Mm. Um, but also if you're a, if you're a keen podcast listener, look out um, because in September we will be um god willing launching a sort of sister podcast to the book mm -hmm. also called the surprising rebirth of belief in god which is very much a sort of documentary podcast style telling of this story of the rise and fall of new atheism and this this new conversation on god that's emerging in all kinds of spheres 
as I lay out in the book. So um, so that'll be a long, long form project, about 22 episodes in all that wow. I'll be putting together for these, 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 this documentary series on podcast. So, um, but justinbriley.com to keep to, for the book and to just keep up with me as well via my newsletter and that kind of thing. Great. I'll put the links on the, on the show notes for everyone to, to look at, but justinbriley.com is pretty easy to remember. So um, yes, please do go there. For more on justin uh, but for now justin thank you so much really appreciate you coming on and and good luck and prayers for your projects going forward thank you so much jamie thanks for having me on <laughs>